That was like the. Here, please, this will log in. Oh, I don't have any internet in here. The following is an excerpt from the article, Is Someone Gaslighting You? Learn the Warning Signs, written by Sherry Gordon. Gaslighting is a form of manipulation that often occurs in abusive relationships. It is a covert type of emotional abuse in which the bully or abuser misleads the target, creating a false narrative and making them question their judgments and reality. Ultimately, the victim of gaslighting starts to feel unsure about their perceptions of the world and even wonder if they are losing their sanity. Gaslighting is usually performed over an extended period of time that causes the victim to question the validity of their own thoughts, perception of reality, or memories. This can lead to confusion, loss of confidence and self-esteem, and uncertainty of one's mental stability. A common result of this is a dependency on the perpetrator. Gaslighting primarily occurs in romantic relationships, but it's not uncommon in controlling friendships or among family members as well. People who gaslight others may have mental health disorders. They use this type of emotional abuse to exert power over others to manipulate friends, family members, and even co-workers. Gaslighting is a technique that undermines a person's perception of reality. When someone is gaslighting you, you may be left feeling dazed and wondering if there is something wrong with you. You may be encouraged to think that you are actually to blame for something or that you're just being too sensitive. Gaslighting can confuse you and cause you to question your judgment, memory, self-worth, and overall mental health. It may help to know more about the tactics a person who is gaslighting you might use. People who engage in gaslighting are often habitual and pathological liars and frequently exhibit narcissistic tendencies. It is typical for them to blatantly lie and never back down or change their stories, even when you call them out or provide proof of their deception. They may say something like, you're making things up, that never happened, or you're crazy. People who gaslight spread rumors and gossip about you to others. They may pretend to be worried about you while subtly telling others that you seem emotionally unstable or crazy. Unfortunately, this tactic can be extremely effective and many people side with the abuser or bully without knowing the full story. Additionally, someone who engages in gaslighting may lie to you and tell you that other people also think this about you. These people may have never said a bad thing about you, but the person who is gaslighting you will make every attempt to get you to believe they do. When you ask someone who gaslights a question or call them out for something they did or said, they may change the subject by asking a question instead of responding to the issue at hand. This not only throws off your train of thought, but causes you to question the need to press a matter when they don't feel the need to respond. Trivializing your emotions allows the person who is gaslighting you to gain power over you. They might make statements like, calm down, you're overreacting, or why are you so sensitive? All of these statements minimize how you're feeling, or what you're thinking, and communicate that you are wrong. Ezra McCandless has done all of these things and more to her boyfriend of eight months and by the time he'd found out that she had cheated on him multiple times with his two closest friends, he had no idea what to believe. He had thought he had seen signs of her infidelity, prolonged touches between her and them, secret smiles and signs of affection that seemed to go on for too long. But every time he had brought them up to her, she had turned the conversation around on him. She would accuse him of being toxic and controlling, wanting to change the way she was with other people because he was insecure. She would cry and tell all of their friends that he was a controlling and cruel person. Over the course of the short relationship, some of his closest relationships had begun to fall apart, with them siding with Ezra on various relationship squabbles. When he initially saw the texts between her and his two closest friends, he felt like he was losing his mind, and to confirm that they were real, he took a picture of her iPod's screen. When both his phone and her iPod showed the same sexual messages, it was only then that he realized what had happened, but soon the cheating would be the very least of his issues. Welcome back to another episode of Dreading, or if this is your first time here, welcome. Today, we are going to be covering the interview and testimony of Jason Mangle, as given in the case of Ezra McCandless. After covering the case so thoroughly and summarizing how the 20-year-old was able to manipulate everyone around her, we determined it would be more impactful to physically show you the response of the person closest to her, the one she arguably manipulated the most in the eight months she spent in his life. As with every other video in this series, the footage used in the video was made publicly available by Rottweiler Investigations. Links to their channel, PayPal, and Cash App will be linked below. And we cannot recommend their channel enough. Their coverage of the Chandler Halderson case comes second to none, and they are constantly uploading new and interesting content. 
Without them, this series could not have happened, and we are incredibly thankful to them. If you haven't heard of the case of Ezra McCandless, feel free to pause the video now and watch our previous videos going over the case. Or, if watching multiple hours of multiple videos feels like it's too much of a commitment, we can summarize the details of the case here. This is Ezra McCandless. She was 19 years old when she started going to Racy Delane's coffee shop in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. She was living in what she stated was an impressive household, as her parents had decided to cut her phone off in an attempt to give her more responsibility. They wanted her to find a job and take on more of her own financial burden. But instead, Ezra opted to use her iPod as her main means of connection to the outside world. It worked essentially as a phone when connected to Wi-Fi, and Racy's provided her free, unending Wi-Fi whenever she wanted to be away from her parents. She began to spend the majority of her time at the coffee shop, and it was there that she made friends with almost everyone who frequented the establishment. All of the baristas and regulars knew who she was, as she would make it her mission to gain their favor, and through very minimal effort on her part, she began receiving coffees for free and acting as the shop's mascot. It was there in August of 2017 that Ezra met Jason Mangle. Jason was a 33-year-old medic in the National Guard, 13 years older than Ezra, although he would deny knowing that detail when they became romantically involved. Almost immediately, Ezra embedded herself into his life. She would talk to the medic about how living with her mother and father was impossible, how they put unrealistic expectations on her, and how her prospects were bleak. She wanted to be an artist, but they wanted her to give up on her dreams in order to be what they wanted, and she didn't know what to do. Ezra made her home life appear so dire to the medic that within a month of their conversation, she had moved into his apartment, and he was already considering marrying her. But their relationship would hit a bump in the road. Three months into the relationship, Ezra had become pregnant. She claimed it was Jason's child, but she had already begun to see another person outside of the relationship, so it's unknown. She made the decision to terminate the pregnancy, which Jason supported, as he felt like he shouldn't have a say in the matter. However, after the abortion, he had a difficult time with intimacy. He told Ezra that he wanted to be with her, that he didn't want to break up, and that he was still in love with her, but even holding her hand and sharing a bed was difficult. He hadn't expected this reaction, and he promised her that he was going to work through it. But Ezra was still annoyed. She told all of their mutual friends that he had closed himself off from her, which made her feel ugly and disgusting and that he was only doing this as a way to control her. She claimed that he was abusive, that he had destroyed her sense of self so completely that she didn't know if she could go on. A significant number of their friends began to stop talking to Jason, believing her claims without question. Meanwhile, she was still carrying out an affair with one of Jason's closest friends, a barista at Racy's, Alex Woodworth. Alex was in love with Ezra. He felt as if she were the best thing to ever enter his life, and in his journals, he would write about her as if she were a religious deity. He spoke about how she made him want to be a better person, how he felt as if she were changing him from the inside out, and how he would love her even if she never left Jason. As for Ezra, she seemed to enjoy making the two men interact with each other whenever she could, bringing Jason into races with her to talk to Alex, and going out to various bars and throwing small get-togethers with the two of them in attendance. Alex wanted Ezra to break up with Jason to be with him especially because she would describe her boyfriend as controlling and abusive, but he felt it wasn't his place to give her an ultimatum, instead deciding that he would be okay with whatever she chose. After cheating on Jason with Alex for a few months, Ezra began another separate affair, this time with Jason's close friend, John Hansen. When Jason had gone away to work for two weeks, he tasked Hansen with checking in on his girlfriend, telling his friend that she had been having a difficult time mentally and needed someone to be there for her. But, instead of being there in a friendly way, the pair had slept with each other multiple times. Following their weekend tryst, Ezra continued to text Alex about continuing their sexual relationship, repeatedly texting him when the next time they could have sex would be. Alex was definitely open to continuing to sleep with his best friend's girlfriend, but he wasn't as eager about it as she was, routinely telling her that he was busy. However, the pair would never sleep together again, as Jason found the texts between them, and immediately confronted Ezra. Before realizing he had evidence proving she had cheated, she denied wrongdoing, once again stating he was being controlling and paranoid. However, after he showed her the texts, she realized she wouldn't be able to use that line of defense. Jason also called John, who denied the affair originally, before eventually admitting that they had slept together. 
specifically in Jason's bed. As Jason continued to process that his girlfriend and his best friend had lied to his face, Ezra told Jason that the affair wasn't what it looked like, and that John had sexually abused her. She claimed that he had taken advantage of her after she had passed out during a night of drinking, and that the second time they had slept together, he had taken advantage of her fragile mental state. Jason, not knowing what to believe, would talk to a friend who would convince them to talk to the police, and it was then that Ezra would accuse John of sexually assaulting her. Shortly thereafter, Jason was made aware of Ezra's affair with Alex, and once more, he didn't know what to believe. According to Alex, he was in love with Ezra. He apologized for hurting Jason, but stated that he wasn't sorry for taking part in the sexual relationship with Ezra. But according to Ezra, Alex too had taken advantage of her. She had talked to him after her encounter with John, and he had pressured her into having sex. This is of course, ignoring the fact that she'd been sleeping with him for months prior. But at the time, Jason didn't know that. Jason asked Ezra for space, but she refused to give it to him. She wrote journals about their endless, timeless love, about how both Alex and John had tried to turn her away from him out of jealousy, and she begged Jason for another chance. She showed up to his work, at places she knew he would be, and would attempt to win him back, and it seemed, at least for a while, that she was succeeding. But on March 21st, 2018, Jason would tell Ezra that he was done with her. He had been made aware of another sexual encounter between Ezra and Alex, one that she had not told him about, and he felt as if there was no way he could trust her. Everything she claimed seemed to be a lie, and he was no closer to figuring out what the truth actually was. Seemingly in response, the following day, Ezra would savagely murder Alex. She would go on again to claim that he had begun to sexually assault her, but the evidence would say otherwise. Again, for the full story, including every lie that she told while talking to the police, and taking the stand in her own defense, our prior coverage will be linked below. In our coverage of the Chandler Halderson case, we talked about Kat, Chandler's girlfriend, going over her interviews with the police. Kat believed everything that Chandler had ever told her, from his spinal cord injury to him getting a job at SpaceX. She believed that this was going to be the man she would eventually marry, and when he was arrested for his parents' murder, she couldn't believe it. She had been with him the entire weekend. She knew the kind of person he was, and she felt the police must have made a mistake. Even after the police had spoken to her, told her the case they were building against Chandler, and explained to her that the screenshots that she provided to exonerate him actually showed that he committed the murders, she couldn't believe that he would do something like that. He had manipulated and lied to her for such a significant amount of time that until the trial, she truly believed that he was being railroaded by a biased police force and ignoring all the evidence, confidently telling him in their jailhouse phone calls that she believed in him and knew that he was being honest. Jason is similar to Kat in this case, as even after the murder, he didn't know what to believe. He thought he knew the kind of person that Ezra was, and though she had willingly cheated on him when she cried and claimed that she'd been assaulted, he felt compelled to believe her. She had made a report to the police, she had told their friends, and he couldn't imagine the woman he loved being able to feign emotion that effortlessly. Then, when he had been told what happened to Alex, he knew that she couldn't have done it. The person he loved, the person he had spent the last eight months with, would not have been able to kill anyone, especially not Alex. He saw the cut on her lip, and the superficial cuts on her legs and thighs, and knew that she must have survived something brutal. When she was later arrested, he was still conflicted. He wanted to believe her, to believe that he had not been part of some sinister plan that resulted in two false rape accusations and a murder. But he was no longer confident. Ezra called him from the jail, sent him multiple letters, and in each, she seemed certain that she would be released. She said the truth was on her side, and she was a survivor. It wouldn't be until he heard the details of the murder, when he went to her first court hearing, that he had realized what she had done. Is that Alex? Yeah, Alex is a great dude. He seemed like a good guy. Met him there the other night. One of the first things that Jason says in this interview is that Alex, the person who was murdered by Ezra, was a great dude. Jason, it seems, is an extremely forgiving person, because even if he doesn't believe that Alex had assaulted Ezra, either of the times that she had alleged, Alex still carried out a months-long affair with her behind his back and in front of his face. Well, like I told you, on our little phone conversation there, I, I don't know that... Maybe just people in the area or community that heard or something. Reporting. Okay. That realized the impact on you as well. You know, oh, yeah, it sucks. Like, I'm, uh, I was socially ostracized pretty much from a lot of this stuff. It's like, for a long time, like, my closest friend group was really, like, off-put. So it was like, 
I mean, I only really had detectives talking to me. My real, my real friends from before weren't really talking to me. Alex always stuck on my side, but it was, it was rough, man. Well, I, bet it, I bet it was. I know when when we were talking to people, you know, they, they kind of didn't want you around and because they didn't know what was going on. Yeah. And like, Even just little things. I would look in the paper and be like, oh, I'd like look up to see what was going on with the case. And be like, oh, anybody was seen walking or jogging or biking in this area. It's like, ah, why would they go biking? You know, it makes you like, paranoid. I'm like, what the hell can I mean, man? Well, we can get going. I don't want to grab your whole afternoon and come in, but as you recall, we did a download of your phone to yeah. early yeah. on. Um, yeah. So there's just some questions in there on that information, too, that we have some questions on, so mm-hmm. this might seem a bit random here. Um, John the Mustache. Okay. Yeah, what all transpired with that? Um, I think you guys have kind of talked about a lot of that already, but you got those pictures um, this came off your phone. I don't know if you remember that conversation, John and Yeah. Cooper, tell me who, who that conversation would have been between. Oh, this is this is Ezra and John. Yeah, but Ezra and John had that conversation, right? Yep. They're showing him texts between Ezra and John, where Ezra is asking John when the next time they are going to be having sex will be. The following are those texts. Hansen, nice. Ezra, it's stressful looking for places, so that would be nice to relive. Working out agon, dose really make you want to fuck everything that's moved. Might also be a predator. Hansen, a body in motion, wants to stay in motion. Ezra, are you going to pound this anytime soon? Sorry, I'm rude. Hansen, not this week. I have Warren. It's alright to be blunt. Just gotta be alright with it coming back your way. Ezra, just let me know when I get my next in and out. Winky face. Also, hanging out and doing art agon would be nice because you're more than a good dick. Ah, uh, that should be nice. He's such a cool kid. Hanson, why thank you. He is a good kid. I'm looking forward to spending some dad time with him. Ezra, that melts my heart. I'd love to paint with him sometime. The next day, she sends him this message. Ezra, feeling like a snake today. What's wriggling in your mind? Hanson, I've been with Warren all day. My mind is pretty preoccupied. Ezra, that's understandable. Dad time. Do you know when that was? Um, I mean, just... I mean, I guess, I'm guessing it would be the dates that are on here. Right, right. But um, when were you gone to the military? I was gone... It was... Uh, actually... Because this alleged assault happened while you were gone to the military. Roger that. Okay. This is going back into... So... So apparently, the fourth was when she said the first assault happened. Uh, I was at recertification on the fifth Monday, and that's when she said assault two apparently happened. Because like she said, there was an assault at night and assault in the morning. Yes, yeah, because so she, the night of the fourth, the the night of the fourth, I believe, is when everybody, Ryan, all of them were drinking together at at his place. Yeah, so, like, so like they're all drinking together, and she. From what she had told me, with, with as much of a, the problem is like dealing with like so many, um, like the narrator is just like I don't know if you're a trustworthy narrator, you know, in these situations. So it's like she said that they got she got so so drunk she was puking and all this kind of stuff and woke up and felt like something was going on that then passed back out and then stuff happened in the morning. That's what she said. But then it was like the the stories kept changing from both of them. Like the story kept changing from John. The story kept changing from her. You know, and I was like, I I don't know what you just highlighted that you just put it in assault. Yeah, I just put that's what she indicated to you that these dates have. Yeah, it happened. So John Hansen kept changing the story in that he originally told Jason that he hadn't slept with Ezra. Then when he realized Jason had proof that they had slept together, he admitted that that had occurred. After that, the story never changed. However, Ezra's did. She claimed that John had sexually assaulted her after she passed out from drinking. Then she woke up the next morning in his bed and knew something was wrong. Then later, she stated when she passed out at his house, she woke up next to him attempting to assault her, but not being able to because he was too drunk and his penis wouldn't get hard. Then the next morning, when he drove her home, the two had had sex 
on Jason's bed because she felt like she was garbage. There were other iterations of that story that Ezra put forth, but to be clear, none of them are true. Ezra and John had had consensual sex. She told multiple of her friends that she had enjoyed her time with John and couldn't wait to see him again. Her texts showed her asking to see him and have sex after the assault allegedly happened, and she only began accusing him of sexual assault after the affair was made public. Once you talked to me about this stuff, I was like, we gotta go like, do something, even though it's like way past you know, the date. Because like, that's what's important to me. And this, it's February 11th, and she's still talking to him. That's what I said. I was like, I don't understand, because this this is what I meant. Like, I was like, I'm like under the impression, like, why would you keep talking to someone who assaulted you, but also the night that I found out about all this stuff from her, I had talked to, I had talked to John, and I was like, hey, so what the heck happened, man? Like, what's going on? And he said, nothing happened. We never had sex. You know, he had, he said all these things to me. I was like, okay, cool. Well, this is what she said to me on my phone. And, and then he was like, oh, then he changed his story again. And then I sent some more stuff, and then he changed his story again. And I was like, okay, I don't want to talk to you about this, because you're obviously not, every time I give you another detail, you change the story. Mm-hmm. So I was like, here, you just talk to Ezra instead. And then I turned the speakerphone on. And I slid the door to make it sound like I was leaving the building. And then it sounded like he was, like, leading her. It was like, it only happened once. It was consensual. This and this. And it's like, it was just, the tone was very strange. I was like, oh, I don't like this way this is going. So I was like, well, both of them don't seem trustworthy at this point. But I'm just going to err on the side of caution. And we should probably go in, you know. And then we came down here and she had to do all this stuff. But. So you were the one that urged her to report it then? I was like, well, I mean, I didn't know if it was an assault or not because I didn't. Okay. And where did that conversation take place? That was at that hotel. Like, I had gotten her a hotel when she was in town, and then she called me back because she was acting all weird and making, like, you know, because she was like, what motel? Uh, Is that the, like, Scottish Inn? I don't think it was the Scottish Inn. It was a different one. It was over by... Like where the clinic is. Okay. So what was the significance in you taking these photographs? No, wait. It was over by Clancy's. Not Clancy's. What's the Irish pub that's by the hospital? Oh, Across the street. There's an an attached motel. I think it's the one that's attached to that one. Okay. Did you kind of call her out on these? uh, Yeah. I was like, well, what the is that why you took pictures of them? Yeah, I was like, what's going on? What is, what are your guys' your guys' stories don't make any sense. You know, and you're talking this way after the fourth and the Yeah, fifth. and I was like, so, and she's like, well, it's like a court, because between all three of them, they were into this crazy existential, like, nihilistic stuff. Like, they're reading all these books, you know, like, there's one about this, like, neo-Nazi guy, and, like, it's just like watching the world burn because nothing matters in life, you know. No one has to be born, and there's the only rules you make are, you know, like, there are no rules. It's like, you can do whatever you want to do, it's just the repercussions. And it's like, I don't know, these books are pretty heavy, dude. Like, I don't know, for a girl who's younger and very impressionable and also, like, kind of spiraling through depressions, because, like, she had, you know, kind of like the postpartum depression thing from the abortion. Mm-hmm. It's like, this is probably not great reading material to be, like, ingesting right now. Like, you're already at a low, you're unemployed. Just, the holiday seasons and stuff like that, like post holiday seasons, so there's a lot of depression issues with people around that time. Absolutely. So I was like, I, I don't know what. what John just seems like a normal guy who wanted to get coffee and then was dragged into all of this. He genuinely seems like someone who is exceptionally ordinary, dealing with the chaos that Ezra had brought into his life. He didn't care about the philosophical debates, he didn't think the subject matter was necessarily helpful or appropriate for any of them to be reading, and he described Ezra as being impressionable and easily influenced by it. He wanted to help her, and that much is clear. Meanwhile, she would tell their mutual friends that he was stale, boring, and conversation with him was understimulating, and also state that he was overly controlling because he didn't like how she would engage with other men. It's like, it's like everyone was talking about stuff, but not talking to me about the stuff. Okay. And, and you said it was the three of them into it, her, John, and... Her, John, and Alex. Yeah, they're and all... And your roommate, Alex? No, no, no. A different... Oh, Alex. The deceased. Oh, okay. Is that who she's talking about in here as well, on that this page? Take some reading, maybe. Oh, this is the stuff that she wrote, right? Yeah. 
Is this like the whole, like, this is how it goes? Yeah, I think so. Uh, but it's who the Alex was is referring to there. Yeah, that's the Alice uh, Woodworth. So. Okay. So she figured you had been talking with him as well? With Alex? Yeah, doesn't she? Yeah, what is? I cannot have any. I cannot have you discussing my case or what? Oh, this must be. This was the assault case, I'm assuming, right? The John? Yeah. The John case? The John case would be assault with John. Because she had said that she had gone to Alex's house after. So, like, initially it happened. I was still gone. Yeah, so she said she was still having at your house. That's what she was saying, that it happened in my bedroom when he dropped her off. But, I mean, I... It's all, like, these these narrators are, like... Yeah. Okay. Um, so that, you would say, is Alex Woodworth there, not a Euro man. This is Woodworth, yes. Is there anything else in here? Uh, I don't think so. Let me just take a look and see on that last page. In the last time we talked, a lot of this, why we wanted to talk today is the last time we talked, nobody had time to go through all your phone download to, and now there's things that we got questions about, that's why we probably just wanted to figure this all out. Um, and we kind of wanted to wait until we had question, all the questions so we could make this a one-time shot. That's the racist thing. You know? Yeah, so where is this board at? This is in the men's bathroom. At Racy's? Okay. And they are discussing the piece of graffiti that was placed in the men's bathroom that said, Fuck Ezra, followed by her phone number. Although no one knows who placed the graffiti there, based on Ezra's pattern of behavior and her refusal to stop going to the coffee shop after the affairs were made public, it's widely believed that she put the graffiti there herself to make Jason feel like she was being belittled and victimized. She would indirectly and directly accuse Alex of being the one who put the graffiti up, but that was widely out of his character. How, how did this come about? Did you write this on there? Negative. Do you know no. who wrote this? I was, I told her this was in the bathroom, and I was like, I don't know what this is all about, but, so I, how, you just happened to notice the phone number, and it was yes. yours? That's a dream. Well, I was like, what the fuck is going on? Like, is it, because someone had mentioned to me, like, oh, is your ex, your ex-girlfriend's number up there now? And I was like, what are you talking about? And it's like in this yellow, so I was like, it looked like someone had written it and then tried to bleach it off. Did you message her? There's some messages about apparently black marker erases and turns yellow or something. Yeah, I said like I tried to like get some of the rest of it off, but I ended up just going over the top of it because it was like, well. Okay. When did you become aware of that? I spoke about every date that I had messaged her about it. It's okay. kind of hard to remember. So when the when the picture was taken, that was probably I would just because like, I went in there and looked like, hey, this is pretty fucked up. Like, because like she was going through this situation where everyone was talking shit about her and making it out to sound like like a whore. I was like, well, that's when the day that it happened. Oh my god. Okay. Do you remember what her response was in reference to that? And I may have not read it. But maybe it's in there. That's fine. You, there's nothing on that. Um, that's when my did did uh, was, was she getting phone calls? I have no she, idea. She she did indicate she all of a sudden people are calling her, oh, <laughs> soliciting. And things. also she used both bathrooms a lot of times because like she I mean it's kind of like one of those situations where I was like I don't know what's going on. While Ezra is in jail, it seems that Jason has begun to think more critically about their time together and is at the point of actually questioning the stories that she told him. Him directly stating that the graffiti could have been done by her is a huge step for someone who's been so heavily manipulated. Moreover, there was absolutely no evidence that anyone had called Ezra soliciting sex. She had said as much, but according to her own records, no unknown numbers had called her, and based on the clientele at Racy's, it's unlikely that anyone was looking at the bathroom wall to solicit sex. I mean, she was gender neutral for quite a while, you know, she like, after like the, uh, when she was younger, all the assaults and stuff that had uh, happened, she decided she wanted to portray more of a, a mask thing, she cut all her hair, she like dressed more like overalls and the guys kind of clothes because she didn't want to be like, seen as a target anymore. So like a long time when we first started like hanging out and dating, she dressed very masculine, she just like, um, 
she didn't want to portray her feminine side of that much. So she would, and like Grace's has always, has always been kind of one of those places where they're more understanding. Like now that Jeremy's gone, especially that you know there's. It's just a bathroom. You know, people just need to go in and avoid. It's not like you have to have a certain set of organs to use a bathroom. Sure. Unless you need tampons or something specific, you know. So the life starts now when you photograph that. Yeah. Is that why you photographed it? I wrote over the top of it because we had had a talk the night or two before with her father, and I was like, maybe it would make her feel better. So you wrote that? I wrote the life starts now. Yeah. What do you mean by that? So, her father, I had talked to her, and she, her and her dad never really talked that much about serious stuff. Um, not Jimmy, but, um... What? Joe Shane? Joe, that one was your prison? Uh, Sir Stanley? Yeah, I think sure. that's Joe Shane, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I believe so. So, like, she had sent me some stuff that her father had talked to, because she said her dad talked to her, and, like, they spent, you know, a good hour or so having a conversation about, like, you know, all this stuff happens... It doesn't mean you need to stop. It doesn't mean you need to stop trying. Because like, you need to take control of your life. But uh, what do you say? Like, a, uh, two, you give her a time. Because like, when they finish their conversation, it was like twelve something or eleven something or whatever. It's like, this is it. It's really like fucking life starts now. Like, get your shit together. Stop worrying about all this other stuff. Stop worrying about like, your mistakes and the bad things that you've done. Just life starts now. Okay. On the Instagram stuff, example two, would that be uh, Julia? Julia, um, her friend? Yeah. It's like, yeah, example o- O2. Yeah. That's Julia. That's Julia. Yeah. I can't remember her last name. So, uh, would Julia post? Yes. Day this kind of went down. Is it a driving day? Well, you're going to the laundromat. Yeah. Oh, the day when everything went down. Okay. Yeah. So you're going to the laundromat. This last kind of year, you're telling her, Ezra, you're going to the laundromat. Yeah, we had a conversation a little bit the night before, and then I woke up early and I ended up taking another nap. But I was like, well, Alice, my Alice, gave me an earful about her still getting mail at the house. And he's like, I was like, you should probably change your mail over. She's like, yeah, I'll do that. I'm going to go to the post office and stuff. And I was like, cool. Sounds good. Here? Or was she going to go I think there? she was going to go in Stanley because she said walk. So, right. um, so I was like, okay. And I went to go do my laundry. So I went to Racy's. Oh, I dropped my laundry off. Came back to Racy's. And I figured, like, I was going to run for a little bit. And then I noticed her coming in. And I was like, okay. Because she had never said anything about coming to Eau Claire, which was weird. Because we usually she would communicate stuff like that. She was like coming around, and she just had this like angry, pissed off look about it. I was like, okay, what? When Ezra initially came to Eau Claire, she had gone directly to Alex's house to talk to him and kill him, but he wasn't home. This was a fact that she lied about throughout her discussions with the police because she wanted it to seem like she had been in town to run some errands and take care of other things when really she only came to the small area to see Alex and to kill him. Didn't know what had happened. I didn't know she'd also been pulled over or something like the night prior, or two nights prior, Joe had said. So like she wasn't even supposed to be driving, he had taken the keys from her. So you were surprised. I was, I mean, I didn't know what the keys came, but I was surprised. She was coming to town. No, because like, I knew she had barely any funds left. She had just started, um, she had just started working at the, the school, but she was also, yeah, she was working at the school, but she was also, she got her TV test, like they had done the TV test, and she was going to, like, um, get it read yeah, the next day, uh, so she could start working, like, in, uh, as a CNA again or something, and I, I had mentioned to her, like, well, yeah, if you need scrubs and stuff to borrow, like, that's cool, I can give you scrubs, because, like, it's hard to grab, like, People that start off doing it don't have like 80 bucks to spend on that set of scrubs. Mm-hmm. So, Absolutely. once we had, had chit chatted a little bit, like, she looked, she looked pissed and was like, hey, if you want to pick those scrubs up and, like, you know, get something to eat after, like, that'd be cool because, like, congratulations, like, I'm glad you're getting stuff together. Like, 
And that that conversation took place over the phone, or when that was at Racy. Yeah, Yeah, because yeah. okay. like she went with Maxwell to drop off art. Uh huh. So like she traded him a painting that he used to paint in the bedroom for some paintings he had done, okay. and then she had come back. Apparently, she had come back when I had already been gone to go get the laundry. Okay, and you talked. The first time she was in there, or when she was first going in, yeah, when okay. she was coming in and then leaving. Okay. You talked inside or outside or outside, I believe. Outside. Okay. And the earlier conversation where she talked about um, going to the post office and stuff mm -hmm. was that over Instagram or was that over the phone? Do you remember? That's a long time ago. So. Probably, I think it was Instagram. I don't think we were using Messenger anymore, so I think it was Instagram. Okay. She kept like blocking and unblocking, blocking and unblocking, and getting pissed about something. Like, Whatever, it's your prerogative. Did you guys have many actual phone conversations, or were they all pretty much <coughs> messages through some sort of? Media? Once in a while, she'd call, but like not a whole lot. Like in like in general in the relationship, or. Uh, after after all this stuff after all this stuff happened and she was kind of living in his family once in a while I think she called me maybe I would say it would be less than fifteen but more than five okay so, so to your to your understanding she was when you would have been messaging her she was still in in family that morning yeah that's what I was okay and the only way she could contact you was with Wi Fi correct yeah she didn't have a phone plan I think she just had like a, it was like an iPad or iPod Touch, something like for like music, but she used it as like a social media device. Okay. I don't think it was an actual cell phone. Okay. And I guess I'm not sure, City of Eau Claire, they don't have public Wi-Fi throughout Negative. any area. Right? No. I mean, some of the parks do, but okay. it's kind of spotty. Okay, so you'd have to be at a business or at her you house. You'd be like a, a residence or like, you know, something that you knew the Wi-Fi for, like... Racy's, you know, a friend's house, like Julia, like the uh, Julia lived in. I think Julia lived in those those dorms by Phoenix Park, kind of. Okay. You know the big, the new high rise ones by the. Uh, yeah, right, um, right off of the confluence area. area. Yeah. Okay. When do you think you wrote the life starts now on there? Was that the day of? Or did did you write it and take a picture of it? Because we can tell by when you took the picture if you remember the. Rip when you wrote in relation to taking the picture. I can't really recall. I know I took the pictures. Could have been the same. I don't know. I wrote over the top of it, but I can't remember when. Um, it's kind of the flow on the 22nd of March. Um, she says, and maybe I'll just read this to kind of see if it jogs your memory. I thought about it a lot, and I think I'll call Wintership to return the tattoo gift. So I can for sure pay for therapy. Yep. Okay. Well, do you know where she's going for therapy? She was going somewhere in Stanley. Right. And I Stanley. believe her family had got her set up with a therapist or something over there. Okay. Because it was within biking. I think she mentioned once it was biking distance. Or maybe that was her work. You know, she went anywhere around here after she made contact to report with, uh, like, crisis and the investigators when she report, uh, reported the Hanson assault? Uh, I gave her a bunch of numbers. Like, the, the military has, like, one of those like, phone numbers you can call that gives you, like, local, like... But a lot of them were only one or two sessions they would do, and then they were paid afterwards. But there was... I don't remember if it was Bolton. Like, the, the fellow from Bolton gave me some options too, or gave her some options to on that stuff, and I don't know if she ever partook of any of those. Might have did some they might have initial done. screening, and yeah, because like she met with the big, the big like he looks dangerous. But he's a he's a teddy bear. Okay, I can't think of his name from the Bolton Refuge House. Bolton, okay. Because um, she was on, she didn't feel like she would go anywhere at some point because like her mom and family didn't want her. Jimmy and them didn't want her, or not Jimmy, um, Joe and them didn't really want her. I didn't want her by me. Like, she, mm -hmm. I think her initial plan, it seemed like, was she just going to move in with Alex for a little bit? Was she going to try to move in with John? Was she going to try to move in with um, Bree? I think it was Bree. 
for a little bit. She talked about moving with her. He's like, I don't know what she if she knows what she's doing. Like, because like ninety percent of the time she had these aspirations for stuff. It's like even now, like, fucking, she was sending me letters for so long. And it's like, oh, can't wait to like hang out and do it. It's like, I don't think you're in the same place as us half the time, man. Like a lot of these ideas and these things that you're going through in your head don't they don't correlate with reality. You know. Let's discuss what he just said. First of all, according to Jason Ezra, after the alleged assault was considering moving in with John and Alex. These are two men that she claimed had manipulated her into engaging in an affair that she wanted no part of, and that she told Jason sexually assaulted her. And yet, she felt safe enough with both of them to move into a shared home with them. This would be after her reporting to the police that John had assaulted her, and she believed that living with him would be safe, and that he would want to do that. Moreover, she was claiming that she had to move out because her mom didn't want her, her dad didn't want her, and Jason didn't want her, but that's not true. Her mother and father were incredibly lax with her. They only asked that she find employment and begin to start paying for things herself. They wanted her to act like an adult because she was one, but every time, she would move out to shirk any potential responsibility. Her claiming that Jason didn't want her is also outrageous as he had no issue with her living with him when she had moved out, and only realized he might not want to be with her when he discovered the multiple affairs she was having with his friends. It's not unheard of or ridiculous that after that discovery, he wouldn't want her around him. But even as he says it, it's clear that that point was repeated to him as a way to cut him down. A sort of, why won't you help me, you're supposed to love me type of line. In our last video on Ezra, the prosecution read out parts of her letters to Jason, which showed that after the murders, Ezra still believed she would be released. She would write about wanting new tattoos once she was acquitted, and she would write about all the things, aesthetically, she wanted to do with her body. And it seems that Jason is aware that she will likely never be released. Mm -hmm. And my roommate Alan's always had a problem with her because he'd be like, some of her stories don't make sense, man. It's like, think about the amount of life she just had. And then think about putting all this stuff into it, these stories that she's had. It's like, when was she doing this? When was she doing this? I was like, I don't know, man. Like, I've never, like, tried to run the numbers. It's like, well, why don't you try to run the numbers, man? Because it's a lot of, like, like when, when did school start? When did this happen? When did, because, like, you know, I started becoming friends with her friend Hagen, her ex, one of her ex-boyfriends, Hagen. Okay. And I was like, did you guys like live together for a while and stuff? He's like, yeah. And I was like, but like, how does this all fit in together? Because mathematically, a lot of the stories like they just don't sew up straight. Is that is that the friend that uh, the brother possibly sexually yeah. assaulted her? But then there, there was also like the fact that she she talked with him afterwards too. Like, okay, they seemed familiar after that. And it's like, is this just like a victim thing? Like. Because I know there was a neighbor or something when she was young, a family member that when she was young, possibly one of Joe's neighbors, like that still lives across from him, a teacher at her high school who had a kid and wife that apparently moved away after whatever had happened. Um, just all these things, and I was like, I talked to her for so long about like you should probably go in and get some of this stuff. Like you should talk to somebody about this because it's not. Yeah. Just shaving your head and pretending you're, like your guy for like a couple of years is not going to fix the kind of trauma that's going on in your head right now. To be clear, all of the alleged assaults that he just listed likely did not occur. Investigators have looked into these claims and they were found to have no backing. In at least one case, one of the people she accused of assault hadn't moved to Wisconsin and therefore couldn't have been able to carry out the assault at the time Ezra claimed the event occurred. She would also change her stories over time. So much so that Jason's roommate and other friends had finally noticed. Similarly, Jason points out that while Ezra claimed she had been sexually assaulted by an ex-boyfriend's older brother, she remained friends with the assailant and even engaged with him in a flirtatious way. All of these accusations were found to be so baseless they were not allowed in court, as the defense would be publicly and directly accusing people of crimes with no evidence. Though it's not uncommon for a victim of childhood sexual assault to be repeatedly targeted by predators, it's extremely hard to believe Ezra's stories at this point. Ezra, it seems, found that by claiming that she'd been sexually assaulted, she could gain a certain amount of sympathy from a person, and that translated to an incredible amount of power. She used these instances as weapons, tools in her arsenal, to get people to side with her and do what she wanted. Like, you got issues trusting people, like, she would go up and down and come to her, like, emotional situations. It's like, you know, there were times where she would make me just get in the car with her and she'd just drive crying. And, like, there was a graveyard out um, somewhere by Stanley. Apparently someone who's super important to her, 
uh, some woman, I can't think of her name, but she died younger. Uh, I don't know if she helped raise her or something, but she would just go up there and like just sit by the grave and cry sometimes. And be like, if she would have been around, like uh, she would have helped me get my life back, back together. You know, like my family just sees me as a burden. Like my mom sees me more as a, like a friend than a child. My, you know, and it's like what well, you do ostracize a lot of people, man. You push people away a lot because you you have this coping mechanism of just running from problems. You just run from a problem, and then you expect someone like in your family to save you when they start to feel scared, like that you might be teetering, you know. Okay. Um, what did you mean, uh, this is a message that you sent. Um, you're, is that you, the Doc Wolf? That's me. Um, please tell me you didn't risk the only place to take you in without communicating your tensions. Is that... That was me. Joe Shane took you in, yes. or... So, like, that was after I talked to Joe. I think I talked to Julia, Joe, and Rosie. And Rosie's her mom, right? Rosalie Anderson. That's her yeah. first name. I, it's been a little, I'm trying to push a lot of this situation out of my mind, like the people. And I wasn't tied into a lot of that stuff, so I'm trying to pull it up and think. This is after I had talked so. to Joe outside the cop. So I still had, had Rosie's, I think. And, I, and he had said, she's not even supposed to have the keys. I took the keys from her. What is she doing in Eau Claire? And I was like, uh, I don't know. She was supposed to get the kids off the bus. And I was like, oh, shit. So then I messaged her, hoping she would be on Wi-Fi somewhere. So I was like, well, if she's going around the city. She might be on Wi-Fi. And I was like, he was already, like, threatening to kick her out because she brought the, she, she had brought a cat. She had done all this stuff. She was ignoring. She was being, she was just not being very, um, for the amount of, like, for the amount of uh, leeway she was being given in the situation, like being, you know, just, just, hi, I need a place to live again, all of a sudden, can you help me find a job, can you help me with finances, like, I'm like, you're being kind of inappropriate about this, like, this is the, her mom was like, you can't live here anymore, you're not living here anymore, it's done, figure it out, so Joe, she showed up at Joe's, and Joe took her in, and I think it was mostly a guilt thing, because, like, he had never really been around there after the, the divorce and all that kind of stuff. Like, he was always there, but not really. Mm-hmm. So I think he took her in to help her out, like, and because her grandmother, you know, Terry, they needed help with Terry because Terry was in the process of passing away and stuff. But what was the second half of that, though, without communicating your intentions? Does that mean to you? Intentions of driving to town because right. she was, she, 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 risked, she was risking the place she was living without telling Joe, hey, I'm going to town to do, and I thought the intention was that she was coming to town to maybe to talk to Alex about the, the letters, because she had talked, she had been fired up, up with the other the day before about those journals she had been doing, and she had mentioned, you know, those journals, like, uh, she got fired up, what do you mean? Well, she was just like, I need to drop these off with with these people, and I was like, I would just send it to him in an email or something. Like people? Like, jo- like John and Alex, so like, like, they need to know, like, that what this is what it has done to me and stuff and I was like yeah but like you don't have to do person to person stuff you can just send it in an email you can send it in a letter over snail mail you can like you could I guess drop it off at the uh, at a mailbox in their mailbox but like a stamp is like 32 cents man like come on you don't have to go there and physically and she said like I feel like I don't have a voice anymore she kept saying stuff like that like I feel like my voice has been taken and I was like well, you've done all this therapy working, like your therapist is helping you, and you're journaling this stuff out, and it's making you feel better, you say, so just keep doing that, like, they already know what they've done to you if they've done this, like, you don't have to tell them what they've done, they've already known this. So what you mean there is that, she, you know, she's risking her place with Joe Shane by just, just driving without just telling driving. him, hand going to Eau Claire to whatever. Yeah, because he's being super understanding, he's like, one of the, she's like I'm like, where is she going to go after this? Ezra's parents were always super understanding, which is why Ezra repeatedly stating that they were abusive and uncaring is ridiculous. If you remember earlier, Jason stated that Ezra had claimed that her mother wanted to be her friend more than a parent, but in their relationship, Ezra had claimed the opposite was true, that her mom and her adopted father were controlling and authoritarian. How Ezra described you was based solely off of your last interaction and what she felt like she could get from you. If you went to get coffee, paid, and told her she should be pursuing her art more, she would describe you as a kind-hearted friend who was incredibly understanding and interesting. 
But if you told her you couldn't afford to pay for her coffee, and her art wasn't that great, and she should probably get a part-time job while pursuing it, she would tell your friends anything that she wanted about you. It feels dramatic to state that she would accuse loose acquaintances of abuse, but she had done so repeatedly. So you must have talked to Joe at some point because you would then, um, a bit later here, actually, actually just before, I'm so lost right now. I didn't know he took your keys. I don't know. I didn't know you were coming to Eau Claire. The situation does not look good. Why did you feel that it doesn't look good? What was your... Because she's going to get kicked out again. Okay. I'm like, she's going to be on the street. And I, I thought maybe, well, maybe she's doing this whole thing so her family kicks her out and she can just, oh, Jason, can you help me out? Or can somebody else save me again? It's like, this is not going to happen. Because, like, it's not going to be, we're going to go back to, like, feeling sorry for Ezra. Ezra's in Ezra's situation is because of Ezra, you know. He says this, but to be clear, if Ezra hadn't been arrested, he likely would have taken her in. She didn't respect his boundaries and was willing to say and do things that the average person wouldn't. I mean, obviously. She just killed someone for him, and he refused to enforce those boundaries. He could have blocked her number, blocked her Instagram, stopped going to races, and moved on with his life the way his friends had told him to. But he continued to engage. I want to be clear, this behavior makes sense. Victims, regardless of gender, tend to stay with their abusers. We are simply pointing out that had Ezra not been arrested, she likely would have used the assault to move back in with him and try to manipulate him back into a relationship. I just know what I saw in your eyes and have a bad feeling. What was your feeling? That she was gonna go visit John or somebody, and, and like, I think I, I thought she was gonna go visit John or Alex and just like be like, hey, this is like, drop off the stuff. You guys fucking did this to me, blah blah blah. And like, I wasn't sure if I wasn't sure if the way, because like the last time with the Alex stuff, I was like, I was worried more for them and like them also, because John was emotionally fragile. I mean, he had gone through all that stuff, you know, and. Even though I, I don't like these guys for what they did, like one of the last things I, I me and Alex, we talked about at his house was, I was like, young like you guys too, man. I made stupid decisions. It doesn't mean I have to like you guys, but I still fucking care about you. You know, you're people. And back when we talked before, you talked about this look in her eyes, and, and I don't remember how you described it. Do you remember what that look was in her eyes? Just pissed. She just looked pissed off. And I was like, I was super confused because she didn't look. She didn't look as as fired up the last time we had talked about all this stuff. And I was like, what about today has made this thing worse? Okay. Because she seemed so, no, like, when we when we talked in the morning before all that, before I went to do laundry, she seemed nonchalant. You know, like, it just seemed like another day. Okay. Had you seen that look in her eyes before? Yeah, like, when she would be, like, in the car going for a drive. Like, okay. and then we just go out to, like, like I said, like the graveyard, we just try to like anywhere and just, you just like, usually just need space to like just rant and rave for a while and scream into the, into the wind and just be like, are you done now? Are you good? Are you feeling better? And I think before when we talked, you talked about she would get so emotional sometimes her driving was not good and you yeah. had to take over. I would take over a lot of times. And I'd be like, I don't know where we're going, but like... Did you guys ever drive out into Dunn County before, or towards Menominee area? Oh yeah. Uh, like, when would it be? I'm not sure how how many times. It was at least three times. But like previously, maybe a month before that or so. Like we went out, we went out like Hoffman Hills once in a while. Oh. That's nice. Do you remember it's, how you got there? Like. Um, what, route route was? Yeah. Nah, I cheated and used GPS. Oh, okay. I think I put my GPS on at the gas station when you're leaving town towards Menominee. And this one with the quickest yeah. route? The I did know that we passed, we took the route where you passed the little Hobbit house. That was like the, here, this will log in. Oh, I don't have any internet in here. Um, so, like, remember I talked earlier about how, like, her dad had had that long conversation with her about, like, this is, like, 
this isn't going to define you as a person. You can always change. Like, you need, you've got to turn stuff around. Like, I'm giving you a chance. You have to be responsible. Like, he, he she pretty much sent me, like, the whole conversation, like, or, like, a uh, abridged version of the conversation. Where she, what, you sent it through? Like, through a Snapchat thing. Okay. But uh, that was, like, the time, I think. I mean, I'm, like, almost 100% sure that's the time that... But that's the actual text portion. So you would have written that. Because of the text is the text, what's actually put in there. That's the time? No, that's the actual time that the message went was right here. So the text is the actual text you take yeah. in. That's what I mean, so I'm just trying to understand. You think that's the actual time? Let me check one more source. Because I think I can still see... I don't know that it's that significant. I just wondered what it was. I think I can see my archived... I think that's the 919 that starts now. But maybe I wrote it down. See, here she, she, she messages you. Um, right here. So, the author yes. 13, that yes. says her, right? Yep. And then uh, you're on there as a recipient. So she sent life starts now. That was on the 22nd. Actually, it'd be our time would be on the 21st, you know, evening time. Okay. Do you remember when this, she sent you this snap or whatever she sent you related to her conversation with Joe? With uh, her father? Yeah. No, I was trying to look it up, but like, it had been preceding this whole event, you know, quite a bit. I mean, a few hours. I think it was days. It might have been a day or a day. Okay. Because it's, that makes sense then. Yeah, she had the conversation. That's why I was so concerned. Was like she had this. She made it almost sound like a life, like life changing conversation with her father, her stepfather. You know, because like well, adoptive father. Because he was he was putting a lot of shit on the line. Because like his his family already didn't want to keep doing this coddling thing with her. They were worried that she was just you know going to continue this cycle of creating a problem, needing to be rescued, creating a problem, needing to be rescued, instead of just, you know, she was supposed to go to school, and for the longest time I thought that she got kicked out for something minor, and it's like, it sounds like she just spent all of her money that she needed on other stuff, and then she couldn't afford to go to school, so then her parents said, well, we're not going to keep giving you money, because you're not maintaining a good grade, but like, so then she came back and she had to work and stuff, and it was like, well, you can't just keep expecting people to foot the bill for you on these things. What Jason says here is important because it gives us another insight into why Ezra felt the need to fake the assault against Alex and murder him. Her family was getting sick of her shenanigans and had it up to here with her tomfoolery. And don't even get me started on the riffraff. They had openly discussed the fact they were tired of sheltering her from the consequences of her actions. So much so that when her adopted father took her in the last time, it had started an argument with the other members of the family. They had all grown sick of her entitled behavior and the way she continued to shirk responsibilities that they said they weren't going to keep allowing her to get away with these things. But Ezra didn't want that. She liked her lifestyle. She wanted to keep spending her days at Racy's, pursuing art, and living the whimsical life she wrote about on her Instagram page. She didn't want to get a new job. She didn't want responsibilities. She wanted people to dote on her and treat her like she couldn't do anything for herself. She would need to do something to justify her behavior, to make it so that anyone who critiqued her or made her feel bad for spending all day in bed would feel like they were in the wrong. She had already claimed that she'd been sexually assaulted, and that wasn't enough to get her parents and friends on her side. They had looked at the case and the majority believed that John had done nothing wrong, so she needed to do something bigger, something that no one could question. So she killed Alex and wounded herself to try and sell the crime. Oh, that's the thing there. Do you remember this letter then? Yep, she gave that to Jenna. Or no, Jenna gave, Jenna wrote this, and then I think I left this in the car the day before, the two days before we had talked, and I had written a timeline on the back of it of kind of the stuff that had happened, and I was like, this doesn't make sense, guys. Like, this doesn't make sense. Who is Jenna, first of That's my roommate's girlfriend, Jenna Van de Zand. Dizan? Yep. Hunt B A N. Uh, Did you have her phone number too? 
Yeah, I mean, it's... Well, she was there. We were just leaving, talking to Alex. I, um, you didn't talk to her then, right? No. February 4th and 5th, is that significant to what you're just showing us? Yep. Oh, wait. February 4th and 5th. February. February 4th and 5th, that was like those two dates. So Assault 1 and Assault 2, all of those certification. So that's just what we talked about a bit ago. Yep. What are these times, or how, how do they play into it? I think those are probably 10 points. I'd say 8. Um, 846 maybe okay like maybe that yeah that could be something to do with the time how how did how would you have arrived at that's pretty specific 339 and i think i went through photos so like the, she had sent me photos the night before 
of her, John, and Ryan all drinking and hanging out together. And I think I was trying to figure out the timeline of like, okay, when did this happen? At his apartment, <coughs> and then you were back at our apartment, and then this happened. So I was trying to like figure out what the what the what, what the what was going on. Like, okay. so you remember what the nine oh nine over nine twenty eight is? Is that the February four? Or what's the sixth and Alex? Was the sixth of February she was with Alex? Oh, six was when I flew out to Denver with Josh. Six of February. Yep. Is that significant? No, six of November. Okay. So six of November, I flew out with Alex, or flew out to Denver, or to yeah, to Denver with uh, Josh, and she said that that's the night that he had taken advantage of her. Alex had because she said that they watched the this movie called The Little Prince. Is that what you would mean there, then, by that date? I'm assuming that's what it is. And then the 7th would be getting dumped. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that was... November 6th and November 7th? No, this the dumping would be... this, February 7th, I think. Yep, the 7th of February. Dumped by Alex? No, dumped by, like, dumped by Ezra, pretty much. She's like, she messaged me, like, I'm moving out. So you got dumped. Yes. Okay. okay. So I was like, oh, you're moving out. And she just said, I just can't be with you anymore. You deserve better. Um, I can't tell you why, but I just can't be in the house anymore. I was like, oh, okay. okay. That's insane. I'm just only doing army training and trying to relax as much as possible. But thanks for sending this in the message. So what month was this when she was with Alex? That was... Uh, when you went November. to... November 6th. Yep, so like the same day. And you flew to Colorado? Yeah, I was in Denver. I was in Denver and then I went to California. So that's how you remember that she's with Alex in November. Mm -hmm. That's why I was like, well, this stuff happened in November. She had an abortion in October, on October 6th, like right around her birthday. So I was like, we got to talk about some of this stuff because like, I lost my mind over this thing, like, you know, this, like, I was torn up inside, like, as soon as we, as soon as we were at the clinic, because I thought she had mononucleosis or something, she was, like, puking every day, fever, like, just, like, not doing well, I was like, you need to go in, I don't have health insurance, you need to go in, like, we can't keep trying to take care of this at home, because there's something definitely wrong with you, mm -hmm. and I had had mono before, so they had told me, like, I'm, like, one of these weird carriers where, like, I have mono in my blood sometimes. Okay. It still, like, exists in my blood, so I get symptoms once in a while, but I don't actually have it in my whole factory. Yep. So I get to experience mono for the rest of my life, which is great, because, like, sometimes it's just, like, out of the blue, I just get debilitated for, like, a week or two. So I was like, I don't know if that's, like, something that can happen. Like, maybe they, maybe somehow there's a transfer of it somehow, because, like, you're exhibiting the same signs as I, as I had when I had mono. And mm -hmm. we took her in. Or I took her in, and then within like a couple minutes, they're like, "Oh, you know, she's pregnant." And I was like, "Oh," and I was just kind of like, "Oh, well, all right." Like, what do you? What do you and then she's like, "Can I get paperwork on it, like where I can go to, to abort this?" And I was just like, "Oh, okay. Well, never mind." <laughs> so we never. Even, do you remember where she went? Pre abortion? Yeah. Uh, somewhere in the cities. Any idea where? No idea. I mean, I was there with her, but she didn't want me, like, I was there for a while, okay. but then she told me, I thought she would want me in the room or something, but she's like, no, I can go and... We can come back to the kind of side track this room from that, so... you remember what the A is or what any of this stuff is in here? Not 14. Well, 14 matches up with any dates, and I... Or maybe this is what's in here. I still have, like... Here by everyone. <laughs> yeah.
the fact that Jason, a 33-year-old, would need to make a timeline to sort out if everyone in his life was lying to him is incredibly upsetting, but not uncommon for someone who has been consistently gaslit over the span of months. You lose a sense of reality because you can no longer trust your own perception. The weeks and months after a relationship like this comes to an end can be harrowing because you begin to realize just how much you don't know. Um, if I did do this... This is the full size of the little prince knight. That's the assault one and two. And then that was the baby. So, like, what's the little prince? That's the movie that they watched. So, like, when that, when that, uh, if the uh, private investigator had come to visit me, I was already, like, I'm so sick of hashing all this stuff out. I'm never look at my phone all the time. So, I kind of just wrote some of this stuff down because like, people have been asking me over and over again. So, that's the night she said that she had gone over and just hung out with Alex. And they watched this movie, The Little Prince, which is like a, it's like a literary expression of suicide. It's like a relationship between an unintended small child in a new neighborhood with an adult neighbor, which is like apparently an art film. I don't know. It's like a really fetishy kind of thing. Um, okay. So it really went down on the seventh then. <coughs> nobody, nobody knows. Like she said that he he kissed her or something, and she said, "No, I have a boyfriend or whatever." But. So that was like the little prince night. That was like the day after I was gone. I think that's the day after I was gone on my trip. Obviously, we know that isn't what happened. Alex and Ezra had been having a months long affair at this point. Moreover, when Alex kissed her, he knew she had a boyfriend. They were friends. He had met Jason. He didn't need to be informed that she had a boyfriend. I think I flew up the sixth. Okay. To December. So, so, yeah. So. I was like, this is really weirdly convenient that it only seems like a day or so after I'm gone, yeah. something is happening, and then you're like creating this, oh, it was a bad thing, like yeah. this really, this bad thing happened. It's like, I don't know, I, uh, I'm trying to figure it out. And that was like my rundown for this. Thank you, look good? Yeah. Those are like people of interest. That timeline and stuff. When did you give that to her? I think it was when we were in the car talking. Like, cause I, sh- I showed her the note that Jenna had, and I was like, she doesn't want to be involved. You know, but then, like, and I showed her like the back. And I was like, when, what is, what is going on with this? Like, what is going on? And I remember seeing it in in the car the day that I had gone to Alex and heard she was there with her car parked there, because I heard car like that had this Pearl Jam CD that when she had been. She had hit a buggy or something when she was younger. Like, mm-hmm. I'm not sure what happened, but uh, ever since then, that, that track, like, skipped. So I was sitting across the park bench, like, waiting for it to come up. So I figured, like, okay, this is really long for her to be inside this building. Like, I'm not, I'm not getting a good feeling. And I eventually went up and, like, knocked on the door and stuff. But I had turned the car off because I was just sitting there idling. So I had turned the car off because, like, the CD was skipping. And I, def- I definitely remember seeing it, like, in the vehicle. Like on the passenger seat or something, I don't know. So, when did you give that to her? Because you had made that map, right? Yes, or I like, made like the convoluted, like nonsensical. Yeah, when did you give that to her? It might have been... I don't know. Um... Oh. Is there... Was it, was it the day this all happened? I don't think it was the day this all happened. It was okay. definitely before that. Maybe I can help with this a little yeah, bit. Yeah, because there was, because Jenna, <clears throat> it, was the, it was the day that she had been caught, that Jenna, it's the same day where Jenna was not going to wake me up. So it was the night, the, the, the day after is probably when I was writing that stuff up, like trying to figure out, because I probably looked at the note and was like, okay, I understand, and then tried to figure out some convoluted, what is going on, what is the truth here? Well, as I flow through Instagram here, there's virtually no messages on the 14th and 15th of March between you two. And it looks like she came to town then during that period of time. Okay. So the day Alex, uh, she went to Alex's was on the 22nd. Yes. So we back up there from the, the 13th and uh, the 14th and 15th of March. Okay. What was going on there? Were you guys at a motel like the Scottish Inn? There's some photos. Yeah, we went to a motel for a couple of times. Do like you think was, just that week preceding? It could have been any time in that week preceding. But, I mean, no, not any time, because it had to have happened after the phone conversation with Jenna. 
because Jenna wouldn't have written the note unless it, it was nearing the cusp, like the end of that whole, like, I'm so washing my hands of this whole situation. Because here I'm defending someone who I'm worried has been assaulted. Everyone's telling me, like, John, that's not his character. He wouldn't, but he's also maybe capable of it. Like, because his ex was like, he might be capable of it. And some of his friends were like, he might be capable of it. But I'm like, I don't want to back anybody anymore. I just want to step away. Because, like, everyone I seem to be getting involved in here is, I, 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 this is they're just not telling me what's going on. Like, I feel like I'm trying to, like, protect some, some of my friends. But she's telling me one thing. He's telling me another thing. And everybody, I, I, everyone... Everybody involved is just feeding me this stuff, and I'm just sick of it. I'm done. And that's like when I said, I'm done talking about it. I'm done talking about it. Well, and she's communicating with you here. Um, I'm leaving now to head over. That was on the 15th. 15th of November. No, March. March. And then are you not coming over a while later? And then there's just nothing. Okay. And then on the uh, 16th, hope you made it back to Stanley safely. So sleep well, little lady. So she must have came over at that period of time. Um, so I'm just wondering, you know, if it was during that time that you showed her that. It has to have been whenever that last conversation with Jenna was. I wish I had. I wish I had that written down somewhere, but. <laughs> No, that's maybe it's difficult to recall. So I also we're talking a year ago, ago almost. It's almost well, it's ago. just when that conversation happened, you know. Um, yeah. So, how many different times was there that you guys stayed in the motel? It's like two or three. There was like, and that was between when she said she couldn't stay at your apartment anymore. Yes. So February seventh, about when you yeah. dumped. And but March then, 20th. But then it was like, well, this is, ha this is why we can't stay at the house. And I was like, oh, Jesus Christ, okay. And then it was like, my, mo my mom is treating me like this. And like, my, well, she's like, I can't be at the house right now. Because like, every time my mom's like, I'm super sad looking. And she's like, stop being so depressed all the time. And she's like, I, I'm depressed, mom. Like, I'm going to do some stuff. And she's like, just get over it. Just get over it. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you can't just get over it. And it's like, I mean, back then I was still under the assumption, like, oh my God, she's been a victim. And like, the only person that's supposed to be taking care of her, and like, you know, one of the people that's supposed to be taking care of her, and like empathizing with her, is just like, get over it. Like, just deal with trauma by getting over it. And I was like, okay, but also, I don't know. Because, like, she had a habit of, like, embellishing a little bit. So I was like, I don't know what's going on. Okay. Um, do you know which other hotels you would have stayed at? Um, there was only two or three. I can't remember. But the one. You stay at the Scottish one. Okay, Scottish. Or Scots, whatever in. This one that's across from the quick trip. Yeah. It's always like last minute, like, that was the day that I think I called my brother-in-law and talked to him, because I was like, stuff is not going well, man. Like, I'm pretty sure like, my ex has just been, like, told me she was sexually assaulted. Like, I was freaking out. Like, I was like, I don't know, man. This is bad. So I was in the back of here talking to one of the officers. And that day you went to the hospital, but you didn't get in to see her? No, they wouldn't let me in. And I didn't find out until later on that it was like, well, but all this stuff is going on. So, I mean, I came to visit, I think, the next day. And um, Rosie had given me, like, the room number. And, like, everyone kept telling me it didn't exist. I was, like, going from, room, like, kiosk to kiosk, like, help desk to help desk. And everyone's like, yeah, that's not our room number. And it's like, oh, they can't, like, you and me, it's, like, the men, like the site board. So, like, they don't really, like, unless you have consent. So I was like, oh, okay. Uh, so I could call her family. It's like, can I go talk to her? Is that cool? And they're like, yes, yeah, that's, that's why we want this. They said they couldn't be there until later that day. Okay. And they wanted someone to be with her. Okay. So I went and visited her, and I, we hung out. We, we played Uno for a little while. Did an art jam, like doodles and photos and stuff. Okay. Did you talk about what happened at all? No, I mean I didn't. I was. I don't think I talked with her at all about what had happened the nights before. I just asked her how she was doing, like if she was alright, like. Okay. Um, I mean, I didn't know. 
know much of any of that stuff at the point. Because I was still, like, it wasn't until a few days later where, like, this thought crossed my mind. Me and Alex were, like, eating hot beefs at Ray's. And I was like, where the fuck did he go, man? Like, if he, he's got to have used money by now. Like, unless he had a bunch of cash on him or whatever. Like, how far can you get without using, like, your debit card or something? Mm-hmm. And he's like, yeah, I don't know, dude. And I was like, this doesn't make sense. Like, whenever a drunk kid falls into the river here, there's always, like, a missing person thing, like, the next day. And he's like, yeah, I was like, I haven't seen shit on it. So, so something doesn't smell right, man. And he's like, well, what if Alex never left? And I was like, like, what do you mean? He's like, well, what if he's, what if he's deceased, Jason? And I was like, oh, Jesus. I was like, it wasn't even crossing my mind. I felt like maybe he fucked up. He did something, like, he did assault her, and then he just ran. Like, he went on the lamb for a while. That is exactly what the prosecution theorized that Ezra wanted people to believe. Ezra wanted people to think that Alex wasn't dead, that she hadn't brutally attacked him, even though she had been covered in his blood. Her goal was to make it appear that Alex had attacked her and stolen the car, leaving her stranded near Don Sipple's farm. That's why she told people the attack happened at Owen Park, that's why she actively hid the crime scene, and that's why she stole and broke Alex's phone. They theorized that her plan was to go back to the scene of the crime and hide Alex's body and her car, torturing his family with the thought that he was still alive, just on the run. And then when me and Alex talked to him, I was like, oh, oh, Jesus. Like, that could be a possibility. And when you're talking Alex, because there's so many Alex yeah, here. Yeah, no, my You're, yeah, my you're Alex at, and you guys were at the uh, Ray's, Ray's Bar eating hot beefs. Hot beefs, okay. okay. When so, was that in relation to when you saw so uh, Probably the weekend after everyone had found out, because... I had gone to Racy's, and I guess some people had already leaked the information, like some family had told some close friends before it was released in the news. So I think, you know, family had told some of Alex's super close friends what had happened, because me and Bree even talked the night, like the night after Alex and me talked about it, and it was just like, it was on the weekend at some point. It was Bree, the blue-haired girl, um, Larson. Yeah, yeah. Um, We had talked, so like I, I had talked to Alex, my out, Zinc. I talked to Zinc about it <clears throat> at Ray's after I had like a really weird reception at Ray's. Like, I showed up at Ray's like I always did, went to order a cup of coffee, and like the two Wisnowski sisters, Ariel and, Ariel and Aubrey, like Ariel just like looked at me with these crazy eyes, and then Aubrey went in the bag and started puking in the trash. And was like, What is going on, guys? I'm like, Can I get a cup of coffee? Is everything okay? She like put it in a, a cup. And then she just walked back and she like got on the phone, she's like talking to me on the phone, like on the, the work phone, like I don't know what to do. He's here. I was like, uh, what is going on? And I just like a to go cup and I put it in. I left and I was like, got home and I was like, Alex, um, stuff is not kosher at race. It's like something is going on. And he's like, what, what do you mean? I was like, I don't know. I got a really weird reception from the girls. Like we've been, no, I. I've walked them home a million times and never drunk. Like, we've, we've been friends for, like, six, seven years. And I was like, something is going on. He's like, oh, I'll go check it out. And then he left, and he came back not too long ago, or not too not too long after, and he was like, they found Alex. And I was like, all right, so where did where they find him? He's like, here in Wisconsin. I was like, oh, well, like, they, they take him into jail and stuff? And he's like, they found his body, Jason. I was like, oh, Jesus. He's like, yeah, he's, he passed away. And I was like, like, do they know how it happened? He's like, no. He's like, oh, okay. Well, shit. Because, like, it was, like, something I had already kind of started to process since our conversation I raised. Because it, it wasn't even in my peripheral vision up until then. So, <clears throat> did she not, she not want to report this John situation right away? Or why did it take so long to finally... I, don't know. I have no idea. It I mean, did take a while, right? I think it's just like a habit she was in. You know, like... She, she didn't report it immediately. Fuck, no, no. I mean, I've, that's one of those things where it's like... I do see, like... You know, I, I, I know women that have been victimized, and they say, like, immediately they want to go home, take a shower, and just, like, forget about it. And then, like, a week or so later, they finally get, like, the strength where, like, they want to go in. But by then, any evidence is gone. So... I was like... When I talked to some of my friends about this, like, not using her as the reference, though, like, being, like, 
Yeah, it's, it's a very common occurrence. Like people don't usually go right to the hospital mm -hmm. and report. Yeah. And I was yeah. like, why would you do, not do that if someone has done this to you? Like, why would you not just go in right away? And she's like, well, like the, I think it was Amy or one of the random girls that I was talking to about. It. She's like, yeah, like it's not, you know, there's. She showed me like a graph of like how many actual reported rapes there are, as opposed to like how many of this and how many convictions actually end up. And it was just like this huge box of like all these people, like unreported, reported, and then convicted. It was like one out of like all these like 175. And I was like. Jesus, and she's like, yeah, that's, that's why it's a problem. How did like, you first come to know that Alex and John, or uh, Ezra and John had been together? Ezra and John? She had told me. And, but right away she basically... No, said, not like right away. But when she told you, it was basically she was assaulted. Yeah, like right away it was like, she had said that, it, that she didn't want to... She didn't want to be in that house anymore, in that room anymore, because of the assault. And it was like Originally, Ezra didn't want to be in the shared apartment because Alex Zink, Jason's roommate, had confronted her and asked her if she planned to help with the household expenses. Or at least, that's what she told her friends when she had moved out. That's why I called him, like, immediately, like, after I found out about the, all this stuff. So it's like, I want, I mean, I, I have one guy that I trust, and I have a person I'm supposed to trust, and I don't know heads from tails. And that's when I started running down some of the stuff she had said to him. Well, he was giving me, you know, if we kept changing his story over time, I would add more, more details. And that's what made me start to wonder, like, well, is he lying? And that, was, that was the call that was made from, from the hotel. From the hotel. Okay. Yeah. And that was prior to any report to law enforcement, right? Yeah. So did she want to go report that, or... Did you I asked her pretty like, much. That was when we went on that car ride and we were driving for a little while. I was like, well, what are you going to do? Like, what, are we going to talk to the police about this? Are you going to, like, what is your plan for this? Ezra didn't have a plan. She had believed that she would have been able to keep seeing John, Alex, and Jason at the same time. And eventually, things would work themselves out. She told Alex that she didn't know who she wanted to be with. And when she took the stand in her own defense, she would claim that she wasn't quite sure she was ready to be in a relationship, even though she was technically in three. She had panicked when Alex found proof. And not wanting Jason to be done with her, she claimed that the sex hadn't been consensual. And she eventually decided, I was like, I'm going to support you either way, but like, you know, if, if you don't report it, it's just, because like, if you don't report it, how do I put it? Because, like, it puts people on the radar, at least, like, for possible, like, possibility. Like, even if it is, like, you don't want to defamate somebody's character and ruin their life and all that kind of stuff. But also, like, if people start to see a consistent habit of this stuff happening and someone keeps popping up a couple times, it's like, well, maybe this is worth looking into. You know, like, if the same guy has a lot of accusations from people. Mm -hmm. I mean, then it could be like, you don't know. It's like, you know, the, 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 the accusations with all these senators and stuff all the time. You never know anymore. Yeah. Do you have any time reference as to when you patched Alex up? I just looked Alex for that today. I tried to find it. I couldn't. What's your best kind of estimate on that? It would have been after the John. It was after I had gotten back. No, it was before that. It was before this fifth. fifth it was before any of the bad stuff had happened. So it had been before February. It was. So it was after I came home from the Redwoods. So it was after November. But it. I'm guessing it was mid or late December. Because I figured, I assumed at the time that it was about like a seasonal depression thing. You know, like the holidays and like the stuff he was going through. They had, you know, I had kind of hooked them up to hang out with each other and deal with, like talk with each other about trauma because she worked at a, at, at a where she was going to school before um, Mary met or whatever, or Mary, 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 Mary she was going there before, and she was like uh, the, what's the word for it, the LBGTQ, like, counselor for, like, helping kids, like, in school, like, talk to their families about their, their like, sexual preferences, how they wanted to be identified, and all kinds of stuff. So, like, Alex was going through all that stuff, because he has this hyper-Christian family who doesn't know that he's either, I don't know if he was bisexual or just, he, I mean, he had done with grown girls before. Cause You're we talking to Alex. Yeah. My, not my Alex, right? right? Alex Woodward. So we had, we had talked about that before. Like, 
you, you know, we joked around all the time. I would I'd be like, oh, you're the sexiest of the Alex group. Like, you know, and we they give each other shit. It was like, oh, the first Alex group, they all died from syphilitic infections. You got to control yourselves. It was like my Alex, him, and there was like three or four more Alex's in our French group. It was like, I can't let the beta Alex's die, man. You guys got to control yourselves. Like, I know when you guys get in the room, you all look so good. But like, but we had a good rapport for so long. And it was like, that's why I was so, you know, I'm like, you hate, I'm going to be gone with Josh. Josh just got dumped. He went through some horrible shit. So we're going to go to Redwoods. We're going to go see a place on Earth where there's so much life. And he's going to smile. And he's going to have a good time. And then we're going to come back and we're going to be better. Because, like, I had the abortion thing happen. So I was pretty downtrodden, too. It's like, we just need to go out there, free your minds a little bit, get back to nature, you know, see some, like, thousand-plus-year-old trees. And... It's genuinely sad watching Jason talk so highly of Alex knowing what happened, but also knowing that Alex and Ezra were lying to his face for months. Even after the betrayal and everything that has happened, he still talks incredibly favorably towards the barista, as well as his ex. So like, but she would get suicidal a lot of times, like when I would go on to D&D and stuff on Mondays with Josh, she'd be like, you can't go because I feel like I'm going to kill myself or something. It's like, why are you going to kill yourself? She's like, I just I keep letting everybody down in this thing. It's like, are you doing this because you don't want me to leave? Like, the house? Is this, like, a power play? Like, is this, like, my one day to go do something we're away from you? Like, because we, we get stressed out sometimes. Or is this actually, like, a thing? She's like, yeah, I just I, don't, I just want to trust myself right now. She's like, do you want me to call Julia? And a lot of times I get a hold of Julia, but, like, she's like, oh, like, what? So can I report? Should I report you? Should I call this up? And she's like, I love, you know, someone did that to me once, and I, I never forgave them, and I wouldn't talk to them. It's like, yeah, but, like, why are you saying this to me if I shouldn't be scared? Yeah. I'm about to... Oh, I, I ate a bunch of pizza before. <laughs> That's such a bad idea. But uh, I'm like, you can't do this to me because I, the, the medical and like the you know like the the side of me that empathizes a lot with people, you can't just throw that at me and then make me be like, I'm just about to bike away and go relax and just go to a different world for a little while and play some nerd games. And you throw this at me to make me feel like I have to come and take care of you. Mm-hmm. And I was like, is this, is this literally something that you're just going to keep doing every Monday? Like, all of a sudden, you just, like, your life is spiraling out of control? Like, the one time I get to, like... So- when discussing manipulation and psychological abuse in the abstract, it's easy for the outsiders to comment, well, why didn't the person just leave? Or, if I was in that situation, I would do this. But think about the person you love the most. It doesn't have to be a romantic partner, just someone who you love and trust. Someone who you would fight everyone else for. Now think about how you would feel if that person came to you crying, telling you that they wanted to harm themselves, that they felt they were a burden to everyone in their life, including you, and they were about to take action to end their life. The impact of that statement would be massive. You would likely feel the need to take action, to stay with them, talk for hours, and comfort them until you feel as if they were in a better position. Logic would fly right out of your head, and you would feel compelled to act. Maybe it would occur to you to call emergency services, but it likely wouldn't because you have heard about how poorly those systems run. Jason was a medic. He saw the patterns. He noticed that her mental well-being would start to plummet when he would hang out with certain friends, and he understood that she was likely manipulating him. But even in those moments, understanding that, he wanted to help her. He thought that she was probably lying to him, but on the off chance she wasn't, it was his responsibility to help her. You can kind of just tell us about how you came to know had Alex cut himself of any significance before that? No, the time you did have to kind of... Oh, yeah, it was pretty deep. Okay, but did you think he tried to kill himself? That's the thing. Is like, I don't know, because like a lot of times, I'm not sure if people are educated on the property. Well, there's some Instagram going back and forth. You commented that you didn't think he... I don't think he was trying to. He was to, trying to, because he didn't cut his arm right away. Yeah, because it was like, it was very deep, but it was this way. And I think it was maybe he was drunk. He didn't feel how deep he was going. But like a lot of times it's like people will do that for show. They'll do this, the straight ones for show. So he, he went this way? He I, went this I way. I was looking down. Okay. Yeah. I'm not sure. I can't remember if it was passenger or driver's side arm. But how did you know about it? Well, she had asked me to come over and take care of him. He was over at Alex's house? Yeah. And like his roommate, Matt, was still there. And we talked a little bit. We were, we were very casual. And I was just like... And I kind of put it over the sink, and I irrigated it out, and I cleaned it all up, and put, like, one or two little things in there, and some, uh, like, there's, like, this super glue stuff that you can use for, like, um, closing up a wound. It's like a, I can't remember what it's called, Derm, the Dermabond. Mm-hmm. And, uh, 
he had just told everybody that it was that the steam wand burned from that work. Because like the, the baristas, they had that wand that you eat the, the milk and stuff up with. So we had it wrapped. So I gave him a bunch of, gave him some curl X and I gave him some tape to wrap with me to clean. But, why was he doing it? She, afterwards, has said it, it was a either leave Jason or I'm going to kill myself thing. As we said then? Yeah, like at the, at the moment, I didn't, she, she didn't tell me that that day, but like later on, I mean, I asked, like, I kept telling her, because we sat upstairs and we like, you know, gave him a big hug, can we smoke some cigarettes like we always did? And I was like, dude, you, know, you can't like, you can't do this kind of shit, man. Like, you only get one shot at this, you know? So was she with you at that time? She was with me. She was like sitting like next to me. But I mean, I mean together, you're a couple. Well, yeah, we're still a couple. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And did he ever try it again? Did he ever communicate with you? Hey, leave her alone. Leave uh, uh, Ezra alone? Yeah. No, not really. I mean, we had one talk, or I was just kind of like, God damn it, man! Like I can't believe you did this to me. Like what the fuck? It's like I mean, I was gone. You're doing all this stuff behind my back, being all shady. I was like. Jason just seems like a nice guy. Imagine your closest friends and girlfriend all betray you in such a deep, intimate way. And this is your response. Jason still sees the good in everyone, even in this situation, and that's truly crazy to see. So was he, did you have conversations about that? About his, I guess, his preferences? Well, his problems with the family and his preferences. Oh yeah, we have drink Greenville, or not Greenville, but uh, Berg off once in a while, get really trashed. Like after me and my ex had split up, me and him, he's a kind of a regular at the joints, so, like, be like, all right, let's split a picture, it's happy hour, like, because I know he would work in the mornings usually, or work at nights at races, and or, he was there the day that me and us were met, you know, like, so we were hanging out at the bench, I, sh- I came to get a, uh, I came to block up my bike by Terry's biking store, I got flat on the way home from work, and pound on the window because it was after midnight, and now I was just like filled up a two-go cup and stuck it out, and it was like, it's fucking closed, and I like, closed the door, and I was like, all right, and I sat down inside, and Ezra was laying on the uh, on the bench and stealing Wi-Fi. I was like, what was that sigh about? I was like, oh, it's just been a fucking rough day. <laughs> but, yeah, we talked to like four in the morning that night. He came out and like chatted with us. We all smoked cigarettes together. And, you know, like, we were always like good friends together. Like, I don't know. Yeah. Um, what's this whole boy thing, though? The boy thing? thing? Yeah. I don't know what... The, like, her being a boy, or, like, him... Well, you were at the court, right? Yeah. And you heard about what she... Yeah, there was, like, the carving, right? right? I don't know if it's to do with... I don't know. Did they ever figure out for sure if it was him or her who had done this? Like, who had mutilated or whatever? Well, she admitted to doing it. She had had carved it in. It was probably to do with, like, her being his boy. You know, like, because... I mean, if, if, if I were to conjecture at anything, it had, it, had, it had to be something like that. Okay, so this, he cuts himself, by all accounts, December-ish. Yeah, sometime in December. So I tried had, to look for it. Yeah, time. that's fine. So from December until March, what's going on between them two? Are they having rendezvous when you're not I looking? I think it's like... They were. At this point, Jason is fully aware of the extent of it. I'm gone for a drill weekend because Alex, like my Alex, I should just start calling him Zink. When Zink, <laughs> Zink would be like, you'd be gone, dude. She'd be like in the shower and out the door. And I was like, I'm going to tell me this shit for a minute. He's like, well, I figured, you know, like she was just hanging out with friends doing photo shoots like she did sometimes. But also like sometimes she wouldn't come home. He's like, I texted her sometimes and asked what's up. And she'd be like, oh, I'm just hanging out with friends. And like sometimes she would be like over to John's and like babysit because he has a son, Warren. Sometimes she'd babysit Warren so John could get, you know, a day off to do stuff and I mean, we were all very friendly back then. Like, our friend group was, we felt pretty tight. Like, we trusted each other. I mean, at least that's what I thought was going on. We all trusted each other with each other. So she's not. To be clear, Jason was probably the only person in the friend group who trusted the others like they were his family. Though Alex was incredibly kind to those who knew him, the philosophy he responded the most to was incredibly self-serving, in that it justified his continued affair with Ezra. It was a necessary evil in his mind, but he regarded Jason as being an abuser to Ezra, despite there being no evidence of this. Moreover, based on how Ezra regarded the world, trust is not something she would be experienced with. 
her willingness to accuse anyone close to her of heinous crimes, to lie to those she loved, and feign abuse, would lead her to believe that those around her were just as dangerous, that they would do the same thing to her if she wasn't smarter than they were. While they might have liked Jason and gotten along with him, it's doubtful that she trusted the medic at all. No, she was so she's kind of needing the place to stay, too. Yeah. And I wasn't even sure if she was working when she was working sometimes. Because, like, she'd be like, oh, i got to stay later, i do this or i do that. And it's like... I don't know why Joanne's is all of a sudden super busy and super not busy. Like, she, she's like, well, I was like, did you get fired? Because there's a point where it's like, did you get fired and you're just, like, not going to work? Like, or you're just going somewhere to, like, hang out? Because I don't understand how you have, you don't have $170. Like, we're splitting it three ways because, like, back then I rent was cheaper. It's like, $170 is so cheap. That is insanely cheap for rent. Right. Like, how can you not afford this? Especially since, like, we drink pretty much free coffee at the coffee shop because, like, the most of the baristas, we just tip them. And they were like, oh, it's not big. you guys are here every single day. Like, All right, cool. Ezra hadn't gotten fired. She'd quit and had been just leaving the house whenever she was annoyed and pretended she was working. So, like, I don't know, dude. What are you doing? What are you doing with your life right now? Are you, you're gone to, like, questionable amounts of time. Did she ever complain about any sex with Alex? Uh, him getting like there was there was com- there was complaints about like um how did she put it um I can't I don't know the terms for this stuff but like where someone forcibly gags you during like oral fellatio like they just w- won't let you there's a name for that I can't think of what it was there's you also can't breathe basically yeah um sodomizing like she like the she was not into like that kind of stuff, but I think maybe it was like more of a making it more um, realistic, I guess, for his side of the, his side of the, you know, to the point thing. Yeah. And so I was like, so would it be primarily anal sex then? I mean, I don't know. I wasn't I wasn't completely privy to it because like every I was trying to at the point like I was trying to be very sensitive approaching this because like not only being like an ex, but also like. I'm not well versed in this kind of stuff. Like I'm not, you know, I know how to talk to some people about these like traumatic things, but like I'm not gonna like straight up ask someone to dump all their shit because right. I don't know how to, I don't know how to respond to it or deal with it. Mm-hmm. But she made it sound like it was primarily, you know, I don't know, from behind, whatever it was. And a lot of times, I don't know which orifice. But was she mad about that? Or not? I don't know. Like, not was she enjoying it? Does it sound like? I don't know because, like, that was another one of those two, two-way two things with, with us or, like, you know, sometimes she'd be, like, she'd say, I mean, we never participated in that because I was, I'm very, like, OCD as shit. And I'm like, I'm not going to be involved in anything. I don't want to get, I'm just not involved in that. That's not my jam. So, uh, I was, like, she always expressed, like, a dislike for that. So, I was, like, yeah, good. We're on the same, the same, uh, we're on the same page. Anything but stuff, you know, anything but uh, but I don't know, like the way because like Matt, you know, the fellow that lived with with Alex, he said that there were times where she was over. So after we had split up, I had, we had like, split up for good. You know, she would talk one way about me. She'd be like, "Yeah, I, you know, I just because I think that was the day that she had left me, or she had, which is confusing because like she was over at her parents' house." She had said, playing cards and stuff. Well, then I found out, like, just out of the photo, you you can see, like, Alex, like, just his arm and his sleeve and stuff sometimes in some of those photos she sent me from her parents' house. I was like, oh, so, like, she was at the parents' house with Alex. She introduced them and all this kind of stuff and whatever. Well, she must have went back to his house that night, and that's when she had messaged me the next morning, like, you know, this stuff happened. Or however that worked out. There was a night where she was at his house, or at her parents' house with Alex. Jason is slowly coming to terms with just how much of what Ezra told him was a lie. It's incredibly interesting to see him realize in real time how much everything she said wasn't true. I'm not sure how it worked out. I used to have this more together back... I don't know. I don't know anymore, dude. It's it's so (laughs) much in my head. Did she ever uh, read you her journals or did she email those to me? Yeah. I think you've seen them. Yes. The silence broke or whatever. Yeah. So what did you make of any of that? I couldn't tell completely. It sounded like a lot of 
It was this painful stuff to read. As you read through it, could you determine who she was talking about? Yeah. In each paragraph? Not each well, paragraph? Well, like, as you got back, um, so it was the love of my life? <coughs> ah, probably me, but I don't think it was, I think it was more pandering at that point. Again, with Ezra being in prison, Jason has gained enough distance to properly perceive her manipulation, though not in real time. He sees her journals for what they are, manipulation, in her wistful prose about how theirs was an ancient, unyielding love as being absolutely false. If their love had been so profound, how could she justify cheating multiple times over, accusing him of being controlling and abusive, and turning their friends against him? Ezra going to prison is by far the best thing that could have happened to Jason. I mean, being she wanted you to read this. Is that what well, I don't know. She, she said she did these for therapy, so maybe she did, was talking to her therapy. Maybe it was one of those, like, I didn't know what I had until I lost it situations where I was just like, well, I don't do do-overs. I don't read Dave Evil, man. Like, this is not, this is not something I want to continue doing. I don't want to continue, continue like, taking care of you. That didn't actually appear to be the case. After Ezra and Jason had broken up, they had slept together a number of times and Ezra was determined to get back together with him. And given the lengths that she had gone to, had she not murdered Alex, there was a high likelihood that they would have gotten back together in some capacity. Did you two discuss these journals at all? Well, yeah, we talked a little bit about it. I said, I'm glad you're doing this. Like, this is probably good for you. Like, it's good to get this all out of your head. And, I mean, it's kind of like a little bit of, when you, when you put all that stuff in the paper, like, it's therapy, man. Like, well, we know where we are now. You know, we kind of know what transpired. Uh, I guess, what are your thoughts reflecting back on that? Reflecting back on well, I mean, how does she get to the point where she drove away from you that day with Eau Claire PD standing by, and by all accounts, more than likely, based on what we know, drove right there? Drove right close to that place? Yeah. I have no idea. Like, I know that when I, when I was at the house, so I sat across the road from that place for quite a while with my bike and just, like, smoked so many cigarettes. And then it took a lot for me to, like, go into the house because I was like, knocking on the door, and I think when I cracked the door open and they heard my ringtone going off, and I heard her yell, just let him help you, I was already at the point in my head where I was like, I'm probably doing something that could get me in trouble, but I fucking care about these people. And I thought, like, she hasn't left. My initial thought was she hasn't left because he's going to kill himself, and, like, he's going to do it right in front of her, and I was freaking out, like, oh, God. She pushed him too far. They're both fucking fragile. They shouldn't be alone together. So I ran upstairs, and, like, I was like, oh, my fucking God. Scared the shit out of me because they're both in this bedroom, like sitting on the bed, and I'm just like, what the fuck are you guys doing? You can't do this. Like, you, you should not, for what's going on and what you're writing and what has happened apparently in this relationship, you should not be alone together right now. Like, you guys both need to, like, go to public place, you need to, like, talk things out because there was screaming and arguing when I, when I was downstairs. So, even after the gaslighting, cheating, and lying, Jason's main concern was that both Alex and Ezra were okay. He just wanted them both to separate, to get help, and to get better. Did you know what they were saying? I couldn't hear anything what they were saying, but there was arguing. Could you tell both, both of them? It sounded like, well, they both kind of had a feminine voice, so. Okay. But. Now then I came outside and I was like, if you guys need me, I'm going to go back outside. Because like, I'm like, do you guys want me to stay here? And they're like, no. You don't have to. It's like, okay, I'll go downstairs and I'll sit on the front, i sit on the porch. You know, if she starts acting crazy, Alex, because he's got these stacks of books like everywhere, it's like, you throw a book against the wall, he starts acting crazy, you throw a book against the wall, I'll hear it and I'll come back up. And I was only, hey, halfway through my first cigarette out there, and then he, uh, the police showed up, and I, I gave them a statement about what had happened, and like another car showed up, and like another car showed up, and I, was, I kept giving the report, and they went to go talk with them, and that's when they were at, at the moment exiting the building. So then I think they split off and were questioned separately. And I had talked to one of the cops about it, and I was like, so, like, what's the plan? And they're like, well, they decide they're going to go someplace public and talk. And I was like, sweet, all right, they're listening to reason, good. You know, and I was like, can you guys, like, can someone follow them? Like, and they're like, no, they're, they're grown adults, they don't have to be followed. And I was like, 
I just don't trust them very much. And he would be proven right. Imagine how different things would have been if any of the responding officers had listened to Jason. And they're like, well, that's, it's not our job to go off like the hunches of you guys. I was like, I suppose. Like, that's a bad waste of our resources. So I was like, well, okay. And they all drove off. And I mean, as we're in Alex, I'll just talk for a little bit. I was like, you know what, you guys? Because like, I had given him a big hug. And we had smoked together like one last time. Which I didn't even know, I know it was the last time, but I was like, you know, you guys, you guys are still my friends. You know, like on the battlefield, like you have to treat the enemy and your soldiers. You don't. It doesn't matter. Out of service. Like who? You know, that it doesn't matter. Life is important. It's not so much that you guys fucked. If you're 24 and 26 or 21, like you guys are young. Like you have so much, so, so many more mistakes to make, dude. It's gonna be fine. I don't like what you guys have done to me. You guys are making me crazy, but like. This is an absurdly forgiving person, and it's heartbreaking to watch. The same way it was heartbreaking to hear the calls between Kat and Chandler. Ezra and Alex both disregarded Jason entirely during the course of their affair. Ezra accused him of abuse and isolated him from his friends. And he still has the ability to try and see the good in her and forgive them both. Something, I don't know. Or maybe he deleted it, I don't know. So getting to the political, what is this alleged assault between Alex and Ezra? Yeah, I don't know what that means. Either. Was there such a thing? She made it. She made it sound like the night. She made it sound like so the, the night where she watched the movie with him, the Little Prince or whatever night, that he had kissed her. Like they went on a walk and she kissed her and she said no. Uh, but then the night she said that like she was assaulted by John, is what she said. The the, the first assault or whatever. She said that something had happened there where um, she had gone over to Alex's and then he, so it, what did it work? It happened that night and then apparently again in the morning, you know, and then she didn't have anywhere to go. She didn't want to be at the house. So I think she said she went to Alex's and she was hanging out with Alex and then he got extra handsy with her about the, about, I don't know, like later at night sometime, I don't know. But I was like, I, I don't, I don't know what that means. Like, she was going to him saying, like, you know, all this bad stuff happened, and he's just like, are you still down to, like, mess around or something? It's like, that seems like the most insensitive thing. It's like, well, I don't know if that's his personality type. Like, it was like, that's like... Not only was it not his personality type, but they had already been sleeping together for months. The rest of the footage will be linked down below and can be found on Rottweiler Investigations' channel but we will end our coverage here for now. Jason had been worn down by Ezra. Though he was 13 years her senior, she had successfully isolated him to the point where she could successfully alter his perception of the world around him. And it would be months until he was able to properly see that. Even while in prison, she continued to try and contact Jason and keep their relationship going. Though he repeatedly stated he was not interested and did not want to continue the relationship, she would continue to call him, telling him that she planned to be out within a year. That way, they could be together. Eventually, during trial, Jason would take the stand to testify. This would be the first time the former couple would see each other again. And while Jason was visibly nervous and uncomfortable to be in the room with his ex, she seemed excited. She stared at him intensely, and though her lawyers had dressed her in soft, feminine colors, she drew attention to the fact that she was wearing a dark green sweater. This was notable, as the sweater had been a gift from Jason during their relationship. Couldn't help yourself, could you? Those present in the courtroom described how uncomfortably focused Ezra was on Jason. She seemed intent to get him to look at her, and her eyes never left him. She had been entirely disengaged prior to his taking the stand, but the moment he was in the room, she was locked in. Meanwhile, Jason would later state that he felt nervous about her unyielding attention. Thank you for watching. This will likely be the last video we make on this case for a while, as seven hour-long videos is more than enough. My brother and I, as always, appreciate the support you've sent our way, and it's our hope that within the next couple of months, we can afford to make our content even better. As always, if there are any videos you would like to see, or a case you want to bring more attention to, email us at dreading.official at gmail.com. Remember to have a great day and stay safe.